So next we have Kristen Dillon with Bureau of Reclamation out of the Denver Technical Services Center. And she's gonna tell us about the yellow-billed cuckoo distribution and habitat use in the Rio Grande Basin. So willow flycatchers and yellow-billed cuckoos are often kind of mentally lumped together when we talk about Southwestern riparian birds. They're both pretty iconic desert riparian breeding species that have experienced uh, significant population declines due to habitat loss and degradation. However, the ecology of the two species and probably even more important, the habitat requirements are actually quite different. And this becomes really important when you're thinking about restoration or management objectives. So yellow cuckoos are neotropical migrants. They arrive on the breeding grounds in late May to mid-June, so a couple of weeks later than many other riparian species. They nest in large, dense patches of riparian vegetation, so especially mature overstory vegetation. And they have a really fast nest cycle. Um, from egg laying to fledging is only about 17 days, and the nestling period is only about five to eight days. So you can compare this to something like a willow flycatcher that has more like a 12 to 15 day nestling period. Uh, pretty typical of most songbirds in our pairing areas. And they feed on large bodied inver invertebrates. So things like dragonflies, spiders, and cicadas. In 2001, the Fish and Wildlife Service determined that there were two distinct population segments of the yellow cuckoo, the Eastern and the Western. Uh, the historic range of the Western yellow cuckoo is shown here in orange, and the current range is these red polygons. So the species has been nearly or entirely extirpated for much of its western range. Um, the largest remaining populations are in New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, we monitor the yellow-billed cuckoo on the Rio Grande from the south boundary of Isleta Pueblo down to El Paso. For today, I'm just going to focus on the middle Rio portion of that, Elephant View to Isleta. We began formal surveys of cuckoos in the Middle Rio in 2006. At that time, we detected about 40 territories. Since then, the population has more than tripled in size. We now typically detect over 100 territories in the Middle Rio every year. Uh, the slight decline in territory numbers that you see in 2019 actually reflects a decrease in overall area survey due to shortages of funding, not necessarily a decline in population size that year. Uh, this graph is showing the distribution of territories by river reach in the Middle Rio. The take home message here is that the vast majorities of territories are in the San Martial Reach. So more than 50% of territories every year are in San Martial. And most of those are in the receded pool of Elephant View Reservoir. So we're able to use this survey detection data and the territories delineated from those detections to begin to look at habitat use when we combine it with veg mapping data. And what we found is that nearly half of territories and more than 50% of uh, detections are in native overstory vegetation. So you can see when you're looking at these graphs, obviously understory only habitat is a large component of cuckoo habitat. Um, it's really important to note that all they, although they will use that habitat type for foraging, it's not suitable nesting habitat. Um, they really need this native overstory for nesting. Um, so we're talking about habitat that looks like this. Uh, basically, dense Goodings willow um, with a pretty dense mid and understory vegetation layer. So survey data um, and territories linear from survey data provide a really good starting point to look at habitat use by cuckoos, but there's certainly some shortcomings. Um, and we really wanted a more precise idea of cuckoo breeding habitat requirements, both in terms of the size of the habitat patch they need and the vegetation composition of that. So for this reason, we initiated a radiotelemetry study in 2017. Um, 2017 was the pilot year of the study, uh, at which time we found that they're rather difficult to target next. Um, <laughs> however, in 2018, uh, we captured and tagged 11 cuckoos in the narrows of Elton View Reservoir. And then in 2019, we captured 12 in the Santa Casha and Escondido reaches. 
These are really interesting birds to try to net because they are not particularly defensive of their territories or their nests, um, and they have really large territories. So this is our attachment technique. Um, we use a piece of canvas, uh, basically full carpets, uh, to attach the tag to the bird's back. Um, and then once it closes its wings over that tag, it pretty much conceals the tag itself and just leave the antenna out the back. So I wanna share with you some of the movement and habitat composition data from two of the birds that we tracked over the past couple years that kind of represent an average of what we are seeing. Um, so this first individual is a female that we tracked to its nest in the Escondido Reach this past summer. Uh, just to orient you to the map a little, each of the red dots is its long tree location of the bird. Uh, the yellow star up here is the nest location. This red outer polygon that you're looking at is what's referred to as the minimum convex polygon or MCP. Um, it basically encompasses the bird's movements during the breeding season. Uh, you can basically think of that as its overall territory. In this case, it was 97 hectares. The green polygon is the 95% kernel home range. So this encompasses 95% of the bird detections. And usually we think of that as encompassing both nesting and foraging habitat. And then the pink polygon is the 50% kernel home range or the core use area. This is kind of the area that the bird uses for nesting. For this individual is four hectares in size. So we can overlay this home range data with vegetation mapping data and begin to get an idea of habitat composition. So for this individual, uh, the 95% from home range, that area that includes both nesting and foraging habitat, was over 50% native overstory vegetation, uh, which corresponds with the bright green in the map up here. And then about a third of it was understory only. So a lot of this is upland vegetation that they're using for foraging. Uh, and then the core use area was 69% native overstory vegetation. Uh, the second bird that we tracked, um, this was also a female that we tracked in 2018 in the Narrows of El Cajú Reservoir. This individual had an 87 hectare territory size, so that MCP. And the core use area was six hectares. So a little bit larger than the individual that we were tracking as Candida, but pretty similar overall. Um, and this is pretty much what we saw. Uh, there were pretty similar home range sizes down in the Narrows and further north outside of Sapporo. Uh, but we did see that birds in the Narrows tend to have a slightly larger home range, probably reflecting the overall larger expanses of suitable habitat there. And when we overlay this with vegetation data, you again see right away all of that bright green on the map, that native overstory of vegetation. So 78% of their 95% kernel home range was native overstory and 94% of the core use area. So obviously native overstory vegetation is really important for nesting cuckoos. And on the Rio, we're really talking about cottonwood and getting swell out there. When we kind of look at all of our telemetry data together, um, one of the big take home messages we saw is that cuckoos have really large area requirements and they're a highly mobile species. Uh, the average maximum distance these birds traveled within a season was two and a half kilometers. And the average maximum distance they're traveling in a day was over half a mile. Um, we saw an average territory size at MCP of 171 hectares and an average core use area of eight hectares. So this is a really large patch size requirement for a nesting bird. If you think about something like a willow flycatcher, they have maybe a 25 meter diameter territory. This bird has an eight hectare nesting area requirement. So a totally different um, order of magnitude. One of the really cool things about having radio tie cuckoos was we were able to track some of them to their nests. Um, cuckoos are notoriously difficult to nest search for, partially because they aren't defensive of their nests or territories, and they have really large territories. But we were able to track some to their nests, and I have a really cool nest video to share with you. Um, 
So this first video is of one day old nestlings. Um, and this is a nest check with a GoPro. As you can see, it's over standing water, which is pretty typical. So these birds just hatched. You can still see a shell in the nest under them. They're already really big, really active, and they have pin feathers throughout their body. Well, a little shaky with the pole, but you get the idea. And then the second video is a five to six field nestling. So it's only a couple days older, but you can see how much more developed it already is. Most of those pin feathers are splitting. And remember, they have a five to eight day nestling cycle. So this bird is only a couple days from attaining full adult size and plumage and being able to fly. And you can kind of see by the way the adult is shoving this massive dragonfly down its throat how I could grow quite so quickly. Um, so I would love to share a video with you for the rest of the morning, but I'm here to talk about habitat. So I will summarize that quickly. Um, looking at both our telemetry and our survey data, the overall thing that we see is cuckoos really prefer native, mature, overstory vegetation for nesting with a pretty dense mid or understory vegetation layer. So habitat that looks like this. Uh, this photo was taken in the upper pool of Elephant Butte Reservoir in 2001. Um, there's kind of when you get into overstory, native understory, you can see there's standing water throughout the floodplain. This is pretty ideal cuckoo habitat. Um, we don't see this too often anymore along the Rio. And to some extent, that's okay. Um, cuckoo habitat does not need to be entirely native. Uh, this is an example of occupied habitat that does have that mature native overstory, but has more of a mix of exotic species in the understory layers. I mean, this is pretty common. We have found though that that understory component is important. Um, native overstory alone without understory structure only accounts for about five to six percent of views. So we're kind of able to put together some ideal minimum breeding habitat requirements based on what we see with cuckoos here on the Rio. Um, first of all, native overstory with that understory component. A Goodings Willow component seems to be really important. Um, I really don't have time to get into this in this talk, but it does seem like cuckoos are preferentially using Goodings Willow, um, disproportionate to its availability on the landscape. A patch size greater than eight hectares and a patch width greater than 30 meters. Uh, so we have found that in general, bigger patches are better. Cuckoos tend to prefer larger patches when they're available. However, they will use these smaller patches if that's all that's available to them. What we kind of still don't know is whether things like nest success vary with patch size. Um, and I think I can take any questions if I have a moment. Yeah, thanks. So I was wondering, when you guys talk about the understory, how dense uh, an understory are you guys talking about? Like, because I know that there's dudes that we used to do some clearings and stuff like that, but then when we go back and we um, put that, that back, you know, we put the things where we have an extra wall and stuff like that to get that back. But how dense exactly are you guys talking about when you're talking about an understory? Yeah, basically, it seems like as long as there is some mid or understory structure, that really makes a huge difference. What really doesn't work is when you kind of have those like gallery cottonwoods, for example, with really nothing underneath, you know, kind of city park style underneath. Um, it does seem like they really need some sort of understory structure. I don't know if I um, know like a density number offhand for you, but basically, as long as it's that multi-tiered, multi-age class type of system. Uh, did you show a slide that showed what uh, substrate they put their nest in? What substrate they put their nest in? So we have found uh, maybe a handful of nests, I want to say seven or eight total in these past couple of years that we've been tracking birds. 
and I don't think I should do slide, but I can just rattle it off for you. Um, <laughs> basically, what the birds that we were tracking uh, down in the narrows, it seemed like we found nests in Goodings Willow uh, pretty commonly. Really interestingly, the birds we were tracking last year um, further north up in Santa Cash and Escondida, I think we found one was in Coyote Willow and the other two are in Russian Olive. Mm -hmm, exactly. On the lower Colorado and the Cody Valley, they're finding them in early successional um, habitat, mostly in these restoration sites. Have you guys seen any of that? Yeah, it's really interesting because um, the habitat on the lower Colorado, I'm not as familiar with Birdie Valley, but at least lower Colorado is pretty different because it is mostly restoration sites. Um, and I know uh, because of that, they have been able to find more nests uh, without tagged birds and been able to look at some of that. We have, we don't really have that type of restoration habitat, so it's a little bit different. Um, we have found nests in kind of like mid age class uh, vegetation, but it still tends to have that like mature native overstory component in the area, even if the nest isn't necessarily in a mature cottonwood. I was actually really surprised when I first saw peak nests. I thought we would find them in these large gallery cottonwood and Goodings Willow, but really we were finding them like more in the mid level than in that mature um, vegetation. And then the mature kind of larger cottonwoods and Goodings Willow were creating cover over that. Have, have you guys looked at um, insect abundance related to um, breeding? We have not, no. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks,